Hello, everybody, and welcome to the eighth installment of the GIPSCO Five Days of Stem Cells event. I am Eric Willems, one of the stem cell scientists at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Yan Hong Shi. Yan Hong is currently a Herbert Horwitz professor in the neurosciences and is a director of the Division of Stem Cell Biology Research at the Beckman Research Institute at City of Hope. She earned her PhD degree from Northwestern and then did some postdoctoral training at the Salk Institute, where she studied nuclear receptors in neural stem cells and neurogenesis. Her own lab, now established at City of Hope, focuses on human iPSC-based disease modeling, as well as drug discovery and applications in cell therapy. Today, Yan Hong will share some of that exciting work with us. Please join me in welcoming Yan Hong. Yan Hong? Thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to share our research on human iPSA-based disease modeling and the therapeutic development with you. So since the breakthrough discovery by Dr. Shinya Yamanaka on human-induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, this platform has been used tremendously for the application in both biology and regenerative medicine. Human iPSCs have been used as a platform for disease modeling. For example, uh, patient somatic cells such as skin biopsies or blood samples or even her follicle cells can be used to be reprogrammed using the Shinya Yamanaka factors into human-induced pluripotent stem cells or human iPSCs. These cells can be genetically engineered to create isogenic controls that have everything else the same except the gene of interest. Both parental and isogenic iPSAs can be differentiated into desired cell types, such as neural cells, cardiomyocytes, inert cells, or hematopoietic cells, for example. Those cells can be characterized for disease phenotypes, subjected to omic analysis such as RNA-seq to identify molecular targets, and these molecular targets can be used to develop a personalized medicine for the individual patients. I'm going to share with you an example of modeling human disease using iPSA platform. Firstly, I will share with you how we can model disease for which the disease phenotype could not be recapitulated in animal models. Such example is Alexander disease, which is a neurological disease that has neither cure nor a standard course of treatment. The most common form of Alexander disease is infantile onset. Those children usually die by the age of six. The symptoms include mental retardation, dementia, spasticity, seizure, and early death. It's caused by a genetic disorder which primarily affects astrocytes, the star-shaped cells in the brain that are very abundant in the brain. And it's caused by a mutation in a gene called uh, GFAP, which is the major intermediate filament protein in astrocytes. The hallmark of the disease, including GFAP protein aggregation and the rosenthal fibers, cellular dysfunction, including oligodendrocyte loss and demyelination. Although various animal models have been created for us to better understand the disease. So far, no animal models could recapitulate the myelination defects observed in 
Alexander disease patients, presumably because of species differences, because human astrocytes are much larger and more complex. We decided to take advantage of the human-induced pluripotent form, uh, human-induced pluripotent cell platform to see whether we can create a human cellular model that could recapitulate the myelination defect. For that, we generated iPSAs from either healthy controls, the ones that have no GFAP mutation, as shown in the first three rows in the table. And we also generated the iPSA from Alexander disease patients that harbor specific GFAP mutations. The mutation of the GFAP could be detected in the patient iPSAs, as shown by Sanger sequencing, as you can see at the top of the slide. In addition to the controls from healthy donors, we also generated a control that's called isogenic control, in which we performed the gene editing in the Alexander patient iPSAs to correct the GFAP mutation to the wild type GFAP using the CRISPR Cas9 gene editing. Because Alexander disease is a primary astrocyte defect. So we differentiated patient iPSAs and the control iPSAs into astrocytes. We then purified those astrocytes using a GFAP promoter-driven GFP fluorescent protein reporter. Because the GFAP GFP reporter can be expressed in the GFAP passive astrocytes very well. After purification, using the GFAP GFP based flow cytometry, we verified the purity and identity of the cells by immunostaining for astrocyte markers S100 beta and GFAP. We can see that nearly 100% of cells are S100 beta positive, and more than 70% of cells are GFAP positive. So now, having derived astrocytes and purified them, from patient iPSAs and the control iPSAs. We next asked whether the patient iPSA-derived astrocytes could recapitulate the key pathological features of the disease, including GFAP aggregation and rosenthal fiber formation. We stained both control and patient iPSA-derived astrocytes with GFAP. While the GFAP staining looks homo more homogeneous in the control iPSAs in, at both the, the left side and the right side. The patient iPSA-derived astrocytes showed a clear GFAP aggregation as indicated by the white arrow. In addition, we found that the patient iPSA-derived astrocytes exited a uh, rosenthal fiber-like structure by electron microscopy analysis, as you can see in the images by AXD997 and AXD999 astrocytes. Those primitive rosenthal fiber-like structure was not detected in control astrocytes, including those from either healthy donor or isogenic astrocytes. The presence of the rosenthal fiber can be further confirmed by double staining for alpha B crystalline and GFAP. That could be detected in the AXD astrocytes, but could not be detected in control astrocytes, including C3 or the AXD999CR astrocytes. So these results demonstrated that patient iPSA-derived astrocytes could recapitulate the key pathological features of the disease, including GFAP aggregation and rosenthal fiber. Next, we wanted to know whether uh, we could recapitulate the myelination defect 
that the phenotype that is the key in the patient brains, but it could not be detected in rodent models. For that, we derived iPSCs into also oligodendro progenitor cells or OPCs. And then we established a co-culture as shown at the bottom of the slides using uh, the wild type or AXD astrocytes together with iPSA derived OPCs. We co culture the, the wild type or AXD astrocyte with OPC on a 3D nanofiber system. That would allow the oligodendrocytes to form myelination along the nanofiber, mimicking the neuronal axons. The myelination can be viewed by immunostaining for the mining basic protein or MBP. The number of MBP positive cells, the MBP positive area, as well as the MBP positive segment length will be an indication of mining nation. As you can see here, co culture of OPC with control astrocytes, including C1 or C3 astrocytes, led to robust mining nation as revealed by the extensive MBP positive cells, the MBP positive areas, and the MBP positive segment length. In contrast, the co-culture of OPC with Alexander patient iPSA derived exercise needs to dramatically reduce the number of MBP positive cells, MBP positive cell area, and the MPP positive segment length, indicating that AXD exercise could, could induce myelination defect. A phenotype that could not be detected in rodent models. We are very excited about this. And then next, we wanted to know whether the GFAP mutation in the AXD patient is actually critical for the myelination defect. For that, we compared the co culture using the isogenic astrocytes that have the GFAP mutation corrected to the wild type. So in the co-culture with AXD999CR, that has the wild type GFAP, we can see robust myelination as revealed by uh, the extensive G, uh, MBP positive cells in both uh, the co-culture along with co-culture with nanofiber. In contrast, the control AXD patient-derived astrocytes when co-cultured with OPC had a much less mining nation. So this result indicated that the GFAP mutation is indeed critical for the mining nation defect, and the correction of GFAP mutation could rescue the inhibitory effect of AXD astrocytes on mining nation. Next, we wanted to know what is the underlying mechanism for the inhibitory effect of AXD exercise on mining nation. For that, we performed only seek of control and AXD exercise, as well as control and AXD patient brains. From that, we found CHI3R1, a well-known marker for neuroinflammation is highly upregulated in both AXD astrocytes and in AXD patient brains. So we asked whether CHI301 could be an important mediator for the inhibitory effect of AXD astrocytes on myelination. To address this question, we knocked down CHI301 in AXD astrocytes using SHRNAs. And then we perform the co-culture with OPC on the nanofiber. Again, we evaluated the myelination using the MBP staining. As you can see here, in co-culture with astrocytes that has knocked down of CHI301 using SHRNA, we could see robust myelination as revealed by 
the number of MBP positive cells and the MBP positive area. In contrast to the AXD astrocytes that we treated with a control SHRNA that do not target CHI3L1, those co-culture had a much reduced myelination. So these results indicate that CHI3L1, a neuroinflammatory molecule, could indeed mediate the inhibitory effect of AXD astrocytes on myelination. So in summary, in this part of the talk, I have shown you that human iPSA-derived glial cells could recapitulate leuk dystrophy myelination defect in Alexander disease, which could not be seen in any rodent models. And the AXD patient iPSA-derived astrocytes could exhibit key path pathological features of the disease, including GFAP aggregation and rodental fiber. Moreover, we have identified CHI3L1 as a key downstream mediator. The GFAP mutant human astrocytes secrete CHI3L1 to inhibit human OPC proliferation and myelination. So these iPSA-derived models could be served as drug screening platform to develop potential therapies for Alexander disease in the future. In addition to a model human disease using a 2D culture, uh, next I'm going to share with, uh, share with you a study we do to model human disease using 3D human iPSA-derived platform, in this case brain organoids. So human CMV uh, stands for human cytomegalovirus. One child is disabled by CMV every hour, and 400, 400 children die from CMV each year. The challenge is to understand how human CMV uh, causes neuropathology is that there is a strict virus species specificity, which excludes us to use animal models to investigate human CMV neuropathology. Our solution is to use human iPSA-derived platform that would allow a human cellular model to study human CMV infection. For that, we took advantage of human brain organoid model using established protocols from the literature. We uh, derived human organoids from human iPSAs and showed that the brain organoids have uh, neuroprogenitor cells that express the typical neuroprogenitor markers such as SOX2 and the TLX, and they also have neuronal markers. Uh, they also express neuronal markers such as BARN2 and MAP2, representing neuronal layer as well. Further characterization of the brain organoids revealed that they have the typical ventricular zone VZ, subventricular zone SVZ, and the cortical plate layer, mimicking human brains. The ventricular zone is typified by expression of the ventricular zone neuroprogenitor marker PAC6, and the subventricular zone expressed the subventricular zone markers SOX2 and the TBR2, while the cortical plate expressed the neuronal marker CTIP2. Moreover, the Brain organoids are functional. They can have calcium signaling in response to stimulation by glutamate. In addition, they can exhibit a spontaneous neuronal network using a multi-electrode array analysis. Next, we wanted to know whether we can use the human brain organoids to recapitulate neuropathology caused by human CMV. So for that, we infected brain organoids with mock control or human CMV that are labeled by a GFP reporter. While the control brain organoids can keep developing and expanding, those infected with human CMV 
have much reduced expansion, mimicking the microcephaly observed in human CMV infected babies. So these results indicate that human brain organoids can be used to study human CMV induced microcephaly. Next, we wanted to know how does human CMV impairs brain organoids to cause microcephaly. We found that human CMV specifically infects the SARS-2 positive cells in the subventricular zone. And the human CMV infected brain organoids exist reduced cell proliferation as revealed by decreased BRDU labeling and have increased apoptosis as revealed by increased staline for active caspase 3, a marker of apoptosis. Then we wanted to know if there is a way we can prevent human CMV induced neuropathology. We took advantage of neutralizing antibodies developed downstairs of our laboratory to see whether the, those neutralizing antibodies could prevent human CMV induced microcephaly in our organoid model. As you can see here at the top row, those are control organoids that can expand along the course of culture. In the second row, we show that infection of organoids with human CMV leads to reduced organoid growth, mimicking the microcephaly phenotype. And in the following rows, we show that pretreatment of the organoids with increased concentration of Neutralizing antibody leads to prevention of the infection by human CMV and inhibition of organoid growth retardation in a dose-dependent manner from the top to the bottom. As you can see, those organoids that have reduce the GFP fluorescence, also have much enhanced brain organoid growth. So these results indicated that a neutralizing antibody can effectively prevent human CMV infection and the infection-induced organoid growth retardation. Next, we, we showed that um, specifically the CMV infection needs to reduce layer of subventricular zone or SVZ and the cortical plate or CP. If you look at the middle panel compared to the control organoids, amazingly, when we pre-treat the brain organoid with the neutralizing antibody 1B2, we could see very good prevention of the cortical structure malformation induced by human CMV in the brain organoid. Moreover, we found that the neutralizing antibody could also prevent the functional defect induced by human CMV exemplified by both calcium imaging and multi-electrode microarray exited neural network. So as you can see here in the middle panel, those are organoids infected by human CMV. Those organoids lost the glutamate-induced calcium image uh, signaling, and they also lost neural network as shown by the MEA analysis in the lower panel. In contrast, pretreatment of the brain organoids with the neutralizing antibody 1B2 could prevent the male formation of the calcium signaling. So both the calcium signaling and the neural network in those organoids pretreated with neutralizing antibody 
are similar to the control organoids without human CMV treatment, as shown in the next panels. So these results demonstrate that human iPSA-derived 3D brain organoids can be used to model human disease. In this particular case, human CMV infection of human iPSA-derived brain organoids could result in severely impaired brain organoid development. Human CMV could inhibit proliferation and induce apoptosis in NPCs in iPSA-derived brain organoids. Amazingly, human CMV infection of brain organoids can be effectively prevented by neutronizing antibody, and those neutronizing antibody could prevent human CMV-induced neuropathology as expected. So the human iPSA-derived brain organoid model of human CMV infection provides a powerful system for us to study human CMV-induced brain male formation, and it can also be used to identify potential antiviral agents to prevent abnormal brain development due to human CMV infection. Those same platform can be used to study uh, the SARS-CoV-2-induced neuropathology in uh, COVID-19 that we are suffering at the present time. Next, I'm going to share with you our journey to find a cure for Calvin disease using human iPSA-derived cellular product. Calvin disease is a lucid trophy. It's caused by mutation in genes called ASPA, which is an enzyme catalyzed the conversion of the amino acid NAA to aspartate and acetate in the brain. The mutation of ASPA could lead to elevate the NA level in the brain, which has been shown to be neurotoxic, leads to demyelination in the brain, and the most prevalent form of Calvin disease is infantile onset. The symptoms of this disease start at the infancy and progress rapidly. The major symptoms include a mental retardation, decline of motor skills and early death. The Calvin disease baby with infantile onset usually don't live beyond the first decade of their life. At the moment, there is neither a cure nor a standard course of treatment for this disease. Those babies can only be treated symptomatically, have no other options. We wanted to develop a cure for those Calvin disease children by using the human iPSA platform. Because the human iPSA, besides their application in disease modeling and drug development, they can allow cell replacement therapy with reduced immune rejection. In particular, the combination of stem cell-based therapy and gene therapy is enormously powerful. The combination of patient-specific iPSA with gene therapy would allow us to precisely correct a patient's genetic deficiency and then return the corrected cells back to the patients, therefore provide an important tool for advancing the field of personalized medicine. In particular, uh, human iPSAs can be generated from individual patients from their somatic cells, such as skin biopsy or blood cells. Those somatic cells can be reprogrammed into iPSAs. Patient iPSAs that have genetic mutations can be genetically corrected using either gene editing or viral transduction to introduce functional genes. Those genetically corrected iPSAs can be then differentiated, characterized extensively both in vitro and in vivo to verify their cell identity, purity, activity, and safety. Those genetically matched healthy cells can be transplanted back to the patients to serve as cell therapy. 
We have developed a, a GMP-compatible manufacturing process to generate human IPSC-based cellular product to develop a cell therapy for Calavan disease. So this is the schematic of our GMP-compatible manufacturing process. We derive the skin biopsy from patient Calavan disease patients, reprogrammed those somatic cells into iPSCs, differentiated the iPSC into, N, into neuroprogenitor cells or NPCs because Calavan disease is a neurological disease. And then we introduced the functional ASPA gene to patient iPSA-derived MPC using a lentiviral vector. Those cells were subjected to extensive release testing and then tested in a Calvin disease mouse model for the efficacy and the safety. Those cells could be used as a potential cell therapy for Calvin disease patients in the near future. So using the GMP compatible manufacturing process we established, we have derived iPSAs from six different Calvin disease patients. So those are the characterization of the iPSA from six different Calvin disease patients. We differentiate the Calvin disease patient iPSA into neuroprogenitor cells. And then we introduced a functional ASPA gene into these neuroprogenitor cells and subjected the cells into extensive releasing tests. As an example, we show here that the ASPIMPC that has a functional ASPA gene introduced into patient iPSA-derived neuroprogenitor cells express the typical neuroprogenitor markers, nesting, SOX1, PAX6. In contrast, the neuroprogenitor cells do not express the pluripotency markers ACT4 and NANOG that could only be detected in the parental iPSCs. Next, we wanted to test the efficacy and safety of the iPSA-derived cellular product in a relevant model. We, used, we developed an immunodeflation CD mouse model by breeding the ASPA near 7 mouse that has a nonsense mutation in the ASPA gene with RAC2 knockout mice that are immunodeficient. The result in the ASPA near 7 RAC2 knockout mice were called immunodeficient CD mice or in short CD mice. Those mice will be characterized to see if they will be a valid model for our uh, therapeutic development. As I indicated to you, Calvin disease is caused by ASPA mutation. So ASPA enzymatic deficiency and the accumulation of the ASPA substrate NAA is a important manifestation in Calvin disease patient brains. So first we characterize the CD mice we generated to see if they have a deficiency in ASP activity and elevation of NA level. Indeed, as you can see here, the CD mice have barely any ASP activity, whereas both wild type and heterozygous mice have robust ASP activity. The heterozygous mice have about 50% of the ASP activity to the wild type mice because they have only one copy of the wild type ASP gene. When we look at the level of NAA, which is a substrate of ASP, consistent with the deficiency of ASP activity, we see much elevated NAA level in the CD mice, whereas both wild type and heterozygous mice have low NAA level. Moreover, this result showed that half of the ASPA activity to the wild type level is sufficient to maintain a normal NAA level. That is why both uh, heterozygous individual human being and heterozygous mice have no symptom. 
And a key pathological feature of Calvin disease is sponge degeneration. That is, uh, that is also called vacuolation. We show that in the CD mice, they are in multiple regions of the brain, there is extensive sponge degeneration as revealed by the white area of the brain. In contrast, the heterozygous mice have intact brain parenchyma. In addition, as I mentioned to you, Calvin disease patients have severe motor deficit. Accordingly, we found that the CD mice have severe behavioral deficits related to motor function as well. In a rotorized test that is used to uh, test the motor function of the mice, we found that the CD mice can barely hold on to the rotorad. So therefore, the latency on the rotorad was nearly zero, whereas both the wild type and heterozygous mice can hold on to the rotorad very well with decent latency. In addition, we found that the Calvin disease mice uh, have much weaker grip strength compared to the wild type and heterozygous mice. So this study showed that the Calvin disease mice could recapitulate the biochemical, cellular, and the behavioral deficits observed in Calvin disease patients. Therefore, they could be a valid model for us to test our IPSA-derived ASPA and PCA cellular product. So next, we transplanted our ASPA and PCA into the CD mice that we have characterized extensively. And we injected the ASPA and PCA into the brains of Calvin disease mouse model that I just show you the characterization. And we show that the human cells can survive well in the mouse brain. The human cells were identified by immunostaining for human nuclear antigen, showing in red in the top panel and show in green in the lower panel. In addition, we found that the transplanted cells can, uh, a, a small population of transplanted cells remain as PAC6 positive neuroprogenitors. A good population of cells differentiated into neurons, as revealed by Newton staining, and astrocytes, as revealed by SAS9 staining, and a small population gave rise to oligodendral progenitor cells, as revealed by oligo 2 staining. Next, we asked whether the transplanted cells could rescue the uh, defect of ASPA deficiency in the transplanted CD mice. As you can see here, in contrast to the deficiency in ASP activity, the transplanted mice have much better ASP activity in the brain to a level that's comparable to the heterozygous mice and wild type mice. Accordingly, we see much reduced NAA level in the transplanted mice compared to the CD mice without transplantation. And this is true for uh, the product derived from three different Calvin disease patients, CD59, 60, and CD68. Next, we asked whether the cell transplantation could rescue the evacuation defect. So for that, we performed the H and E staining of the transplanted brain. In contrast to the CD mice that has extensive Vacuolation as shown by the white area in different regions of the brain, we say much rescued uh, vacuolation in the transplanted brain to a level that's more comparable to the heterozygous mice. We also look at the myelination. As I indicated to you, Calvin disease is a look dystrophy with myelination defect. Indeed, we saw that in the CD mice, there are dramatically reduce the number of intact mining sheets. And for any of the remaining mining sheets, they are much thinner as revealed by elevated G ratio. In contrast, the transplanted brain have much more intact mining sheets and also thicker mining sheets as revealed by reduced G ratio. Next, we asked if the transplantation 
with ASPI and PC could lead to improve of motor function. So for that, we subjected the mice to the rotorized test and the grip strength, as I showed you earlier. And in contrast to the CD mice that could not perform well in the rotorized test, the transplanted mice have much improved motor function, as revealed by substantially increased latency on the rotorized. Likewise, the transplanted mice could also perform much better in the grip strength test compared to the control CD mice. So these results indicated that the ASPI NPC could rescue the CD mice at biochemical level by reconstitution of ASP activity and reduce NA level at a cellular level by reduce vacuolation and myelination defect and at a systematic level by improve the motor function. In to behavioral test. Next, we wanted to know if the ASPI MPC could provide a sustained efficacy. So for that, we, re we evaluated the ASPI activity and NA level of transplanted mice six months after transplantation, instead of in addition to the three months evaluation as I just showed you earlier. And we found that the ASPI activity in the transplanted mice sustained at six months after transplantation, in contrast to the uh, lack of ASP activity in the control CD mice. Accordingly, the NA level was also maintained at a low level in the transplanted mice six months after transplantation. Moreover, we found that the vacuolation defect could also be rescued in a sustainable manner in six months transplanted mice, the vacuolation remained to be reduced substantially compared to the control CD mice. And we performed the behavioral test. As you can see here, the control mice dropped from the rotor rod very rapidly. The transplanted mice could hold on to the rotor rod extensively to a level comparable to the heterozygous mice, if you see from the video. And if you look at the quantification, we can see that the transplanted mice could hold on to the rotor rod much better in the rotor rod test compared to the control CD mice. And similarly, the transplanted mice have much better performance in the grip strength as well compared to the control CD mice. In addition, we found that uh, the CD mice have reduced survival compared to the control wild type and the heterozygous mice, whereas the ASPI MPC transplantation could improve the lifespan substantially. Next, we asked uh, how good is the safety of those mice. An important safety concern for iPSA-derived cell is the tumor genicity. So we evaluated the transplanted mice for the tumor formation by using KI67 index, which is the proliferative index. We see very low KI67 uh, staining, indicating no mitotic index in the transplanted brains. More importantly, we found that um, the mitotic index do not increase with time. Instead, there is a decrease of the KI37 positive cells from three months to six months. So these results indicated that the ASPI MPC cellular product uh, exit prelim preliminary safety profile in the transplanted mice. So in summary, in this part of the talk, I've shown you that the SPI MPC could rescue vacuolation, myelination defect, and behavioral defect in the transplanted CD mouse model. Therefore, they are promising cellular therapy for Calvin disease patients to rescue the spongy degeneration and myelination defect in the patients with the hope to uh, rescue the motor function deficit and uh, pro prolong the lifespan. 
So with that, I would like to thank the lab members in the lab who have uh, done the research. The Alexander study was led by a graduate student, Lily, who is now a postdoctoral fellow in Stanford University. The CMB study was done by a, a staff scientist, Georgie Sun, and the Caliban disease study was done by a team, uh, a GOP team, led by uh, postdoctoral fellow Li Zhaofeng, together with uh, staff scientist Yi Tian, Fei Chao, and the graduate student Lily. Uh, the Caliban disease study was a collaborative study in collaboration with our neurosurgeon Benham Badi, manufacturing director Joe Goat, David Su, neurologist Neil Prakash, an expert on cell and gene therapy, Dr. Zhang Zia. The CMB study was in collaboration with uh, Dr. Don Diamond's laboratory with his scientists Flavia and Flex. And uh, the MEA study was helped uh, set up by Dr. Rusty Gage's lab with Carol Machado, and the brain organoid uh, platform set up was helped by Dr. Guo Li Ming and Hong Jun Sang from UPenn. And the CRISPR Cas9 platform was helped to set up by Dr. Feng Zhang and his fellow Naville from MIT. And we also wanted to thank Dr. Ruben Matalan, who is an expert on Calavan disease, for his uh, guidance on our Calavan disease cell therapy development. And I also wanted to thank CERN for their uh, generous support of our study and the NIH, Herbert Horwich Foundation, and the Saito Kagan Foundation. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I will stop here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yang Hong. That was a great presentation. You really covered everything that you can do with stem cells, from disease modeling to more modeling of in 3D as well as cell therapy. So amazing work. Um, you know, in the next 10 minutes, we'll try and address some questions from the audience. So audience, thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions that you would like to have addressed live by Yan Hong, please submit them through the question box right now, and Yan Hong will address them live for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so a, a first question that we already have came in was around the work you've done for Alexander's disease. So you, you indicated that based on the experiments that you did that the reduced myelin inhalation is, is caused due to this indirect effect of OPCs generating that that um, that protein. So, so the the question was whether in in the um, Alexander's context, have you done any direct comparisons of the OPCs themselves? Like, you know, have you looked at them functionally? Have you looked at transcriptome or proliferation of the OPCs? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, we actually didn't directly compare OPC because uh, the Alexander disease is caused by GFAP mutation. And the GFAP is expressed in astrocytes, but do not express in OPC. So therefore, we do not expect any difference in OPCs from wild type or Alexander disease patients. And the, we believe the OPC defect, but we do detect OPC defect in both our co-culture system and in Alexander disease patient brains. We believe those effect was resulted from astrocytes that have the GFAP mutation, because when we co-cultured wild type OPC with the Alexander disease patient IPSA derived astrocytes, we were able to see reduced OPC number and the myelination defect. Okay, thank you. 
Um, another question that was also related on the Alexander story, but maybe a little bit more high level. Um, question is focused around the choice of how you're doing your disease modeling. So you, you went a CRISPR Cas9 approach to generate your isogenic pair of cell lines to to do your um, biological studies. In terms of comparing that to to the approach where you take iPSCs from disease patients and iPSCs from healthy patients, what what are sort of the ad advantages over the CRISPR model between patient derived control lines? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, that's actually a very important uh, question in the field as well. When the IPS modeling was initially started, we mostly used controls from healthy donors. And then with time, we found out that there are quite extensive individual to individual variation due to the genetic and epigenetic background of each individual is very different. So therefore, oftentimes, if we just compare a patient brains with, I mean, patient cells versus healthy donor cells, we see lots of differences. But many of those could be just resulted from the individual to individual variation instead of directly related to the gene mutation that causes the disease. So the isogenic control would allow us to examine the cells that have everything else the same, including both genetic and epigenetic background, but have only difference in the gene of interest. In this case, only the GFAP is mutated or wild type in our isogenic cells. Everything else were the same. So in this way, the IPS control will allow us to ask the question whether the phenotype we observed is specifically caused by GFAP mutation, but not resulted from any individual to individual variation. Okay, thank you. And the, the next question was around your organoid work with the uh, CMV infection. So, so you, you showed that the uh, CMV causes malformation of the cortex as, as you apply the, the virus onto the organoids. And the, the question is around the timing of that virus addition and, and whether that would be causing a different effect. So, you know, I think from what you showed, the CMV is added early on, and then you see an effect on, on increased cell death and reduced proliferation, which then sort of causes the microcephaly. Um, and that, that's probably the, the most relevant for, for the phenotype um, in, in humans. But the question was wondering whether you've looked at virus addition at different time points, you know, for example, before the formation of the progenitors, during formation of the progenitors, and maybe in a later stage when the progenitors are are differentiating and organize itself into that organoid structure. Mm, we actually, uh, I I don't know if I can jump to the slides. We actually um, did the infection after we have the organoid formation. We uh, the day zero doesn't mean day zero from IPSC differentiation. We actually developed the organoid first, and then we infected the virus uh, to the day 45 organoids. So those organoids have the uh, layer structure of neuroprogenitors and neurons already, and uh, uh, they are developed already mimicking the uh, second trimester of the human fetal brain development, which is the stage when CMV infection of baby causes microcephaly occurs. So 
we we try we tried to mimic what happens clinically by choosing the stage of the organoid uh, development. But I think it's still interesting to try the uh, time course to look at uh, if we in fact organoid at a later stage to see whether we will also be able to have some neuropathology that would mimic maybe a, a more later stage infection. Those we didn't do. But I, I think it is something uh, worth looking at in the future. Okay, thank, thank you for clarifying that question. Um, so then, you know, may, going going back to your your cell therapy and and the replacement with the overexpression on on the disease the disease the cells to sort of rescue that phenotype. I mean, obviously, cell therapy and Overexpression of different targets is is a really hot topic right now. Um, so, in terms of get getting some of that work in into an actual clinic to start treating patients, what are sort of the main challenges that you see to take what you have today um, into the clinic? Uh, actually, for our study, uh, we so we have conducted a pre-IND meeting with the FDA already. Um, so basically, I think our efficacy has been uh, very robust. And uh, now, after our pre-IND meeting, we, we are now planning for the IND enabling uh, safety study. And if the safety study is, if the safety study result is good, as we have seen in the preliminary safety in our uh, observation, we seen a long course of the efficacy study, then we should be able to start our clinical trial. So we are now um, rigorously uh, designing for the safety study that has been approved by the FDA already. And we, I, I didn't, and I don't uh, see a very obvious uh, hurdle at the moment. Um, depends on the results we will see for the short term and the long term safety study. I believe we should be able to move it forward in a timely manner. Uh, in terms of cell therapy, in general, beyond what uh, I presented here, I think um, there are two ways. One is autologous cell therapy, another is anogeneic. So each has its advantage and the disadvantage. While the autologous cell therapy, I believe, is the golden uh, is a golden way to do it because we will have no more com no complication of immune uh, complications. Uh, but then it's also expensive. So with the development of the technology, hopefully it would become much cheaper. Then it will become more available. The analogic one, I think, could be more economical at the time being but it has a potential immune complication. So that's why people are looking for a universal donor. So each has an advantage and disadvantage. So far, I think we wanted to provide a proof of principle. Okay, thank you. All right, so that ends the Q&A session. So thank you again, Yan Hong, for your presentation today. And thank you to the audience for joining us today at the Five Days of Stem Cell event. Uh, we enjoy, uh, we hope you enjoyed the rest of the event for the next couple of days. And thank you again for um, joining us in a virtual world. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, the audience.